Today is Monday, May 22nd, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian Podcast. I'm your host, Nate. So, today, what will heaven be like? What does the Bible say about heaven? But I can't use the Bible to answer it. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so, in a nutshell, what the Bible has to say about heaven, without a lot of conjecture from other people speculating, uh, that was the that was the guidelines the questioner had. Um, anyways, so we talk about that for a while. Then we talk about Isaiah 42. Is it talking about Muhammad as the messenger? Of course not. It's talking about Jehovah God. That's who the passage is about. That's who they're singing a song unto. Uh, so we talk about Isaiah 42 for a while. And then for some reason, um, someone wants to know about uh, Steph's giving birth. So we talk about birthing stuff for a while. And then we get into some more uh, in-depth conversations and, you know, the Gospels eventually ending on the Trinity. Surprise, surprise. A um, little bit of a different take. Uh, Tyler joins us for a while and imparts some knowledge about that. And, um, yeah, we break out Strong's Concordance a little bit and go to bluelitterbible.org. It's a great resource, free resource, um, to learn about original words. So how do we know Isaiah 42, for example, is not talking about Muhammad's the messenger in this passage? Because the original word is Jehovah. Um, well, Jehovah, we have the J's. But that God not a man, not a mortal. So that's how we know. Um, anyway, check out the Ask a Christian book available on Amazon, free with a Kindle subscription. Check out the Ask a Christian store, grab a t-shirt, support the podcast, or click on the donate link. All these links are in the podcast description to support this cause and this podcast, which is sharing the gospel to people of the internet. Uh, take care. Happy Monday. See you all later. Okay, yeah. So in general, the bible's idea of heaven and this is you know this is scattered throughout different authors different books so in a nutshell though it tells us heaven is a place where it's going to be basically all good all happy no sin no evil no sadness uh there are scriptures that say you know god will wipe away every tear from everyone's eye so no one's going to be sad no one's going to be mourning you're going to be worshiping in the presence of your creator forever and it's painted as this most uh you know the most just amazing existence you can have infinitely never ending um and we're told that you know god himself will be the light so i i believe i don't want to misquote but since you want it off the top of my head um there's no need for a sun god himself will be the light source i believe and it talks about how you know basically every precious gem that we would call here on earth um they're the ideas they're so common um that it's it's like the equivalent of heaven's building materials so we're told you know it will be like streets of gold like you know pearly gates, uh, you know, like diamonds, precious gems, things like that. And um, everyone will get like, you know, their own, their own house or their own mansion. And um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of in a nutshell, the idea of heaven, Um, no evil, all good, the presence of God. And yes. There will be houses and people will be living like a normal life on earth. Well, you said you wanted just what the scripture says. So I'll get yeah. you the references in a minute, but yeah. No, 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 I, I, I don't yeah. need the yeah. references, but um, someone else told me, and this thing is going to annoy you because I will use it a lot, that they will only be souls. They don't need anything like houses or places or anything to own, and they will only be singing the whole time. Uh, no, so we're told that we're going to be worshiping God. Um, whatever that means, like, you know, we would say we can worship God. That doesn't just mean like, you know, praying and kneeling or something like that. We can worship God. We're told from the Bible in everything we do, do it as unto the Lord. So, you know, we can worship God. Um, if you're a cook at a subway drive through or something. Um, so, you know, in whatever you do, give glory to God. So does that, does that mean we're going to be like, you know, angels chanting day and night? Um, but we're told that we will have glorified bodies. So we're not going to be disembodied spirits. We're told that we'll have glorified resurrected bodies, just like Jesus does. And we're told that uh, we'll be known in heaven as we're known on earth. So it's not like people are going to have to re-meet each other. Like if you know someone, that's how they're going to be known in heaven. So it's not going to be spirits. It's going to be glorified bodies. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I believe it's clear enough. Uh, brothers, do you have anything you wanted to add? Did you hear his question? If you're speaking? 
No, I don't really have anything to add at the moment. Currently, I'm uh, taking my medicine. I need a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, so blue. Um, yeah, that's the picture of heaven you get. And that's, uh, you know, that's taken from verses uh, scattered all throughout the Bible. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, welcome everyone else. Happy Monday. Hope everyone had a good weekend. Let's send out some random invites. Feel free to accept or not. Hey, Vic, what's up? Hey, Nick. Um, nothing much. Um, I um, was wondering if I missed out on his question because I just heard, like, what is heaven like? Is that how what he, he phrased the question? Um, it was kind of like how what is heaven like like not uh not conjecture and not just what people kind of like talk or guess about but really based on the scriptures in the bible so like what is what is heaven like based like very very close to th what the bible says heaven is like oh okay because like later i heard him talk about like some singing thing um so i was like oh wait did i miss the question that he was asking and I was like sitting in the chat, putting stuff in the chat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was the part, let's see, where it talks about, you know, heaven is portrayed as like this uh, place of like endless, unending type worship and adoration of God. And ooh, let's get Chris up here. Um, and I think that's, let's see, is that Thessalonians or Revelation? Yeah, in Revelation 4 and 5. It talks about, you know, how God um, is going to be worshipped in heaven by heavenly beings and, um, you know, worship and adoration of God. So some people, like it's, it's some people <laughs> will be like, oh, I'd rather just go to hell than to be a flying angel with, you know, a fat belly and little cherub wings and fat cheeks like worshiping God all day. I'm like, well, I don't necessarily think that's going to be how it is, but I definitely guarantee that you would probably rather do that um, than hang out with the devil. Um, don't want to assume, but, you know, I'm pretty confident in that assessment. Yeah, What's that you, is Chris? <laughs> Welcome. Good morning. Hey. How's it going? <clears throat> pretty good. What's your thoughts on uh, what heaven will be like based on what the Bible says? Well, um... Theologically, heaven is simply where Jesus is. It's not a well, specific you know. place. Like where, so. wherever people are going to infinitely hang out forever. So like skipping, right. skipping any intermediate stuff, skipping millennial reigns, skipping like, you know, if people yeah. believe we're going to come back on earth for a while. Like, you know, like trillions and trillions of years past that, when we're still hanging out, go from that point. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a new heaven and a new earth. So that's what God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Um, so again, theologically, we're going to be where Christ is at. Um, but the other thing too, is that the creatures that are praising him, um, pardon me, day and night, those are specific angels that were created for that purpose. That's not us. I mean, there's going to be events where everyone bows down. We see the 24 elders bowing down. But what are they doing before they bow down? You know what I'm saying? It's not like they're bowing down for eternity. You know, things like that. So you can get that from the immediate context of the book of Revelation. Yep. Steph, you want your mod badge, you better get up here. <laughs> oh, are we doing Ask Christian today instead of Ask a Satanist? We're doing uh, no drama. How about that? <laughs> 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 Ask a Satanist. Do you, <laughs> is there really a question whether or not he serves the dark one? There really or, is. is a, yeah, there really uh, is well, a question. Okay. Yeah, people people are there there's a whole thing out there that says that he is LARPing as a quote unquote Christian, but he's actually a real for life, like not Jamesy style, but like the other style of Satan worshiper. Okay. Come well, wait, on. wait, wait, wait. It was 
an affiliation, a suspected affiliation with the Silver Star cult, which is, I mean, you can look that up. There, there are some sources online that, I don't know, that, that's speculative. He's never confirmed. That is a pretty tall order. Order of the Silver Star. Yeah. Alistair Crowley? Come on. That's it. Yeah, yeah I'm not joking. Um, oh, and by the way, um, Mark Robert wants you to know that you know that you can turn $300 in investment into 10 k profits in three days in the chat. I put such high hopes in Steph to, to handle things like that. <laughs> she literally has a baby I got it. Lap. Yeah, I'm also... The kids are getting ready for school, okay? Bear with me. Hey, I support women's rights, so work woman. <laughs> just, just kidding, I'm joking. <laughs> You're going to have to pay for her emotional labor from Friday. <sighs> Hang on, let's see the order of the silver. So what did Crowley do, like, besides, um, like, is this a spinoff of one of his other weird stuff, like, or is this the main thing? This is the main thing. Hmm. So, yeah. I mean, you know how there's, like, houses now, right? And they have members? Yeah. There's an actual house that has over 600 members about our mutual friend. Oh, I thought you were talking about, like, uh, I thought you were going, like, uh, deep dive into, like, weird stuff, like the Masons or Shrine oh, yeah, or that something too. like that. Like, cl that clubhouse houses, okay. Yeah, clubhouse houses. Like, yeah, there's there's a whole, there's a 600-member mm. clubhouse house about our uh, our friend that had your room go on for, like, seven hours on Friday. Was it seven hours? And had everyone blocked from the room, so we all missed Right, and we can't even we can't even listen to the replays because we're blocked. So. Oh really? Ah. Yeah. Pick a. Yeah, that's where order there's order there's silver stars. This is a waste of time. This is. Oh yeah. What's up? Rick Grimes in the chat. Rick is correct. What's Rick saying? Yes, some of us have not forgotten. No. This is really my never bigger knew. qualm than the. It is. There are many, many hilarious videos of him circulating the internet. Okay, so those are that's that's what I put my stock in. That's comedy gold. But... Hey, Sub Zero. Hey, what are we freezing today? The well, Nate. Hey. The only other thing is that there was a lot of doxing that he did. And well, so yes. he's a doxer. What's up, so I want Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, this question uh, because it was clicking in my mind since a very long time. Now, uh, what uh, do we get any uh, who relates in Christianity as a reward? Like uh, is there an uh, is there a system where we get uh, who relates as a reward by the uh, the Christian god, the god of the Bible? Uh what didn't quite get all that. Okay. What, what's the so, question? Like, um, so, are you aware of the concept of Huris? Like, you know, in Islam, we martyrs uh, for, uh, like, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, we are uh, rewarded with, like, Huris in Jannah. The paradise, we will be blessed with uh, the beautiful companions. Like, they will be blonde, they will be redheads and brunettes and very beautiful <laughs> ones. Do we get... No, I'm not joking. This is true. A uh, Quran. Oh, do yes. you get like Christianity get, like, does not have. So, do you get like uh, uh, heavenly heavenly sex slaves? Is like like women and stuff? Is that the question? Yeah, not actually sex slaves. They will be our uh, companions. They will be our oh, like uh, wives. I think that uh, they. No, I think that they euphemistically no call them companions everywhere else too. Yeah, no, no companions. The idea in Christianity is, you know, um, being reunited with uh, our creator um, and Lord and Savior transcends any type of carnal companionship. Um, so once we have these glorified bodies, um, we're the idea is we're going to be so um, amazed and enthralled with being reconciled to our creator, the one who made us, that nothing like that type of companionship is even going to be. A concern. 
Um, I see. So not even in this dunya, not even in this world, we get uh, companions for the sake of uh, the God of Bible, right? Uh, yeah. So just think of how awesome your picture of many, many companions um, for or against their will would be, and then imagine better than that. I think, Sub, the idea of women uh, are not subjected to being uh, enslaved by men for all eternity. So that's how we arrive there also. What's up, Laura? What's up? Do you you guys have answers? Maybe. What's the question? Uh, The question is, what is your reputation for Isaiah 42.11? Isaiah 42.11. You think I would know this by now? It sounds like something we talk about every day. Isaiah 42.11. Give me a moment. Also, we're probably not going to refute any scripture. Do you want to fine line that question? All right, so Isaiah 42 11 says, Let the desert and the cities lift up their voices, the villages that Kedo inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Sela sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Right? So Kedo means Arab lands, and Sela is a mountain in Medina, in Saudi Arabia. And Isaiah, Isaiah 42 is talking about a prophet or someone, or messenger that's going to come after Jesus. Oh, sorry, after Moses. I don't get that at all for 42.11, so let's see. Let's back up a little bit. Sing to the Lord a new song, starting from 10. His praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that, fill, uh, all that fills it the coastlands and their inhabitants let the desert and its cities lift up their voice the village that carried your inhabitants uh, let the inhabitants of Sila sing for joy let them shout from the top of the mountain let them give glory to the lord and declare his praise to the coastlands the lord goes out like a mighty man like a man of war he stirs up his zeal and cries out he shouts aloud and shows himself mighty against his foes so there's no way i'm um, just from reading this you can say something like god's going to send a messenger I think, um, first of all, the context is this is singing a song about how awesome God is. But if you wanted to read into it a little deeper... Well, it doesn't you say could... God. It doesn't say God. It doesn't say singing a song about how awesome God is. It, it, says, it, it, it literally says, sing to the Lord a song. When someone says Lord, capital L, that's that's Yahweh. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God uh, of Abraham, yeah. Isaac, and Jacob. So, so Lord means a man of noble rank or high... No, no, no. no. Okay. So, yes. in, yeah, no, no. Hold on. So if you want to talk about a lord like King Arthur or something like that, or an Arabian prince, if they're going to be called a lord, that's like, you know, a little lord. That's like under the under the stewardship, like under a king. That is not what we're talking here. So when you see lord, it's capital L. That specifically talks about uh, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, so originally, the original Bible, it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it just said lord. But the new guy changed it and made Lord mean God. Give Lord us your evidence God. for that. The original Bible. What is the original Bible, sir? Is it the is, so? This verse has gotten corrupted as well. Yes. Ah, I see. So let me ask you a question. So, if the Bible has been corrupted, and the Bible is the word of Allah, correct? Is the Bible mm, before it was corrupted yes. was the Bible the word of Allah? Yes. What makes you think that the Quran has not been corrupted? That is similarly the word of Allah. And what evidence do you have to say that the Quran has not been corrupted? If the Bible, which was the word of Allah, which Allah was somehow powerless to prevent its corruption, what makes you think the Quran is not corrupt? Because the Quran is memorized by millions of people. Currently, so, so is the Bible. History. Yeah, so, 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 so again... Why? No, no, no. You have to answer the question by logic. If the Bible was the word of Allah and it got corrupt, what is your reason for thinking that the Quran could not have been corrupted? 
Allah because was powerless. Because something that well, wait, wait. Was po- was no, Allah powerless? Let me you... answer the question, right? No, no, no. So was Allah? Wait, I'm wait. trying to do it in oh. sections. Hey, 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 hang, hang on, guys. This is this is killing my face. Before before all this, it's very simple, right? So the original word um, is Jehovah, Jehovah, the one true existing God. So there's no way around that. The original Bible, your words, would say Jehovah. So that's the answer. Continue. Oh, I posted the link in chat, by the way, so you can fact check me. So, it's, so uh, it gives you the. It, wait, hang on. In in chat, there's a link you can click on it. It's Strong's. In case anyone's wondering, H three zero six eight. Yahovah. Yahovah. So 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 this actually proves my point even more because what you just said is Isaiah forty two speaking about someone that's gonna come after Moses. So is it saying a God is gonna come after Moses? Yes, that makes, that's Jesus. That makes no sense. No, it doesn't how's make that, sense to you because you have it, been blinded. But so here's the here's the God, thing: you didn't that, answer my question. You didn't answer my question. My question is: first yeah, of all, you, you didn't allow me to answer your question. Because no, so no, you because you want to gish gallop somewhere else. No, so here is my, you see, you I'm sorry. Here down. is my here is my question, my Muslim friend. I'm not your friend. Did was Allah <laughs> powerless, brother? Brother, was Allah? powerless to stop the corruption of the bible yes or no no he wasn't powerless to stop the corruption of the bible then who was more powerful than allah that allowed the bible to be corrupted it's not about power it's god oh what is it about about so So humans are more powerful than allah they corrupted they they corrupted allah's word somehow really i won't let you just keep speaking and i won't shout over you so if you want to have a conversation you ask a question or you make a claim or a statement, then you have to let me respond. All right. So go ahead, make one claim or ask the question. Let me let me make right. a question. I asked you a question. You refused to you answer. Know, you know, you asked you asked about twenty questions and you made about one hundred claims. He wants to know if in the Quran does it say that God preserves His word. Does it say that? Ask that. He didn't even ask that. You guys that, just make up. That's what he's alluding to. No, he's not. Uh, Chris, is that is that what you want? Yes. So you want me to show you where in the Quran it says that the Quran is preserved? No, I want you to show me where God, where Allah preserves His word. Yeah, he because if to Allah, read it if to Allah him. allowed the Bible, so the, here's the here's the logical premise. See if you can follow along, or you may not have graduated third grade. So, okay, so here is the premise: if the Bible, which is Allah's word, was corrupted. Why do you think that the Quran has not been similarly corrupted? What is your reasoning? Answer that question. Okay, so anything that is memorized by multiple people and enormous amount of people cannot be nope, corrupted. stupid. For example, Lots of more people second, memorize the Bible. Go ahead. Why you Go on. Me off, right? Next, Why next you point. Me next second, point. Your point is for stupid. Example, next. For example, twinkle, twinkle, little star is more preserved than your Bible. Okay, if the Bible goes missing today and Twinkle Twinkle Star goes missing today from all the books on the world in the world, you're not answering the question. So either answer the question or admit defeat. 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 Whereas the Bible, you can never find it again if it goes missing. Cool, today, cool, cool. Are cool, you going to answer the question, or are you going to continue to gish gallop? I've answered the question. That's why I'm not Quran answering the question. Gonna... No, in the Quran. Okay, does it... thanks, everyone. Yeah, Lou, go ahead. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's your fault. Ha ha. Oh, sorry. So I mean, I guess the original, you know, the original point. Um, I guess he he just says no. Like even though Lord means Jehovah. Um. I guess it, it doesn't, or I mean, felt like that was the thing that should be talked about, but he just kind of, you know, went on singing stuff with you. But, um, yeah, he was trying to claim Matuba. that the Lord is, is Mohammed. I know, but I mean, <laughs> based on the text, it's like you can't do that. And then if he wants to say millions of people have remember, memorized the Quran, well, first of all, start with page one and recite it to us, but I really don't care. Um, but also, it's not like people that, you know, came up with the Torah didn't ever memorize that either. So, just saying. Um, <laughs> Matuvu, what's up? Are you? Spe- oh, um, if you're speaking, we don't hear you. Uh, usually, if you leave and come back, that will fix it. 
I have a headache now. Thanks. Are you speaking, that, Lou? That was just funny. Yeah, um, I, I don't got I don't got too long, but that was kind of funny. <laughs> Where you see funny, I see just pain in my ears. Yeah, they can't, uh, they can't answer that question, by the way. When they claim the Bible is corrupted, and you ask them why they think the Quran is not corrupted, they can't answer it. They have no hand. Well, I have a question about that, Chris, because... <laughs> The baby is very happily eating breakfast. Um, they say their claim is that more people have memorized the Quran. So anything that they're writing down now is from the oral history. But, and this is a total noob 101 question. Are they referring to the same texts exactly that the Jews memorize to this day? Or is it something different that they're claiming they memorize? Well, they're claiming that, so the claim is that the oral tradition of the Quran was written down based on the people memorizing it. And that's simply untrue. Yeah, that's right. But not... my question is, is the oral tradition they're referring to, the Quran, is that the same as the Old Testament that is also from, I mean, okay, so on huh? the side of Christianity, we have the oral tradition as well as the documents, Right then they're relying on the oral tradition. Is this the same exact documents we're referring to? So the oral tradition of the, ta like uh, in, the, in Jewish tradition is, is the oral Torah. And that oral Torah, it has some of the same content in the Torah, but it's mainly treated as like an exposition of the Torah. For Muslims, they don't have that, right? So uh, when they say that the oral tradition, the unbroken chain of narration, they really mean it is what the Quran is. What people memorize in those first three centuries is what's in the Quran, is what they would claim, right? They do have other traditions, right? And it's what the Hadith narratives are. It's like stories about the prophet or noblemen or the companions uh, that sort of act as a, as a lens or a tradition that gives like uh, interpretations or insights into certain things in the Quran but usually when they say the Quran is orally transmitted they really are referring to the Quran itself and not like the external tradition surrounding it whereas the Jews say oral Torah they're talking about it like a different uh, they're talking about something different got it okay and, and thank Luke. you and, um, and, my follow up question then would be but we, ha we can make the same claim so why is that their trump card their whole thing is like, um, it's like they want to say because of these different variants, the variants or quote unquote contradictions, it can't be the case that the Bible is preserved, right? So they'll point to Ahaziah being 42 and 22, uh, which, you know, you look back and there's all types of solutions. They're just these random things. And they'll say it just doesn't exist in the Quran. They don't have like these numerical discrepancies and these different things. What's interesting about that is they have seven different kira, which are different recitations of the Quran. And they say, well, it was given this way. Well, there are places where Allah says I, and it's changed to we, right, in another recitation. Or it's a singular verb, and it turns into a plural verb. And there's examples like that all throughout the Quran, right? Uh, different, between the different recitations. So they have basically textual variants, but they don't call them that. They just say that these are different ways that the prophet recited the Quran that were hmm. memorized. So. And uh, Lou posted something. Let's see. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> oh my God, pardon me while I continue dying today. So apparently, uh, the question he was trying to get answered that never went answered or never remained unanswered in Surah 59. Indeed, it is we, there you go, instead of I, it is we who have sent down the reminder, the Quran, and we will surely preserve it. Uh, Surah 41, 42, falsehood cannot, falsehood cannot come to it from before it or behind it. That would be the Bible, from before or behind. It is a revelation from one who is wise and praiseworthy. Surah 56, 77 to 78. Indeed, we have sent down the Quran and we will surely preserve it. Surah 15, 9, indeed, we, it is we, who have sent down the, some weird word, uh, it means the Quran, and surely we shall guard it from corruption. So, especially the one where it says before it or behind it, 
uh, Surah 41, 42, that's talking about the Bible. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of like a checkmate, which I guess is when he started singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Chris, if you were thinking about converting to Islam, did we walk you back from the ledge? Oh, yeah. Question. But he's gone. And I thought maybe Tyler could answer it, but he's also gone. So if their claim is then that the Quran is more correct than the Bible, because, like, is does it then rely on the idea that more people have it memorized? Like, what? The Twinkle Twinkle That's Little Star thing. That's what he was trying to claim, yes. Well, and it's also a much shorter book. Like, it's, like... I mean, it's, it's like very, very, I mean, it's like the size of like Isaiah, right? Like Isaiah and maybe one other book. Like it's, it's very small compared to, um, you know, the Bible and a lot of it has the Bible quotes in it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, well, you know, that's like appealing to popularity kind of, it's like, well, does it matter how many people follow religion? Like that just means more people can still be wrong. So it's like, it doesn't matter how many people memorize your book. Like people who memorize stuff can still be wrong. Yeah, um, you know, what's interesting is because they believe <clears throat> Allah's previous revelation has been corrupted, and they'll be like, well, we don't believe that it was corrupted, but they know they know what you mean, right? So they'll say, you know, the Torah got corrupted, and the Angel was just lost. Um, it was never entrusted to them. The, the Angel is the gospel, by the way. And so what's interesting about that is once they say that, they can't know that the Quran is preserved. And you actually have some groups of Muslims, some that are Shia, believe that the Quran is corrupted, right? So there's a debate between some groups of the Shia and some groups of the Sunnis where they believe the Quran is corrupted and they debate that, right? Um, so it's really, it's really an interesting thing that the Sunnis try to do because not even all of Islam believes the Quran is preserved. Isn't a lot of the Quran set like, I guess, like, you know, outside of it also being shorter, that a lot of it is set to uh, lyric, I guess, you yeah, know, like a lot of them. It is literally used... made to be memorized, yeah. It's, it's made to be Coincidence. <laughs> it's made to be memorized, <clears throat> and it's like, and it, it, like the Quran, you could probably, in the time it takes you to read the Bible, you could read the Quran probably through 50 times, hmm. right? It's but most significantly shorter. Most Muslims I've talked to don't really even know the Quran that well. Like even with it being shorter, like to me, it's like they know more about the Bible than they do the Quran. Yeah, there's a this one Muslim named Eminem. I, I'm not even sure that he's memorized a page of the Quran. I, I can't be certain about that. But you know, they make it a big deal to try to memorize pages of the Quran. But he. He knows everything about like New Testament textual criticism, mainly the liberal scholarship and stuff. But he knows everything about that. Like he knows little to nothing about uh, like his own Quran's preservation or about like the differences in uh, in in like the different recitations in the Quran. Uh, it's very weird. Uh, are are you calling it. Islam a meme religion to uh, Christianity? Uh, I do think uh, Islam is a very funny religion, but um, there are people I respect in Islam, but there are some people, you know, like Eminem, who are I don't respect, and I just kind of think they're kind of a joke. Whatever happened to that one guy? The um, remember that guy that used to come over here? He was like very peaceful until we weren't like buying what he was selling, and then he started freaking out and like yelling, and then he'd always come back and apologize for losing his cool. He was the atheist Dang. that converted to a Muslim. N no. Okay, no. He, he, was, he was the um, guy that says he, he grew up Christian, was like a youth pastor, and then he oh, became atheist, and then he became Muslim. You're talking about Khalil. Yeah, Khalil. Yeah, Khalil. whatever happened to that guy? Wait, Khalil yeah, Do you really want to hear that story? Because there is... Ka Khalil Lula. The, yeah, he's a, he's a child molester. Yeah. He's in jail. What? Getting what? He okay. said that Jehovah's Witness. Did, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of information coming coming at me. Yeah. Okay, so we all know the same guy we're talking about. Yeah, is that, is a, that legit? Is that why he's not been around? That's what I'm asking. Did the conviction actually happen? Because last yeah, night, six months ago, 
court. Yes, he's convicted. He's in prison. Wow. Okay. Yes. Can someone please? Wait, wait, wait. Hang on, hang on. Wait, 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 hang on. Okay. <laughs> Just back up like six to eight months when the guy routinely came in was super peaceful until we were like, no, no, we're just going to say it's Christ. And then it'd freak out and yell and scream and curse and come back and be like, I'm sorry, I lost my cool, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's the last I knew of him. So since that time, he did some messed up stuff not and then got convicted. The no, no, no. So being not a Jehovah's Witness? Time. Not in between that time. Where's the Jehovah's Witness coming from? So I thought y'all said he got, got in trouble for being Jehovah's Witness. No, no. no. Okay, well, I think he's making a joke about Jehovah's <laughs> Witness being child molesters, but look, so here's here's the basic gist. So he wasn't, he supposedly, don't know how true this was, but he wasn't molesting his stepdaughter when he was a Muslim because he became a Muslim after being an atheist for a time. It was when he was an atheist that he was doing that. Um, and he uh, was, he was still like, mentally and emotionally or uh, physically abusive and stuff with his wife and kid but he wasn't doing that anymore supposedly that's what he claims and stuff like that but he was doing it when he was an atheist he did it on and off for some time and she was like 12 when it happened um and so he got convicted for that i think he got sentenced to like eight plus four years consecutive um so he only has 12 years in prison. Um, I don't know if there's a possibility of parole. I forget. But, Nick, but yeah, the, the only reason we know all this is because his ex-wife came to Clubhouse in the atheist rooms and aired all of the court documents and the results of the rape kit. And like, it, what, like we're not we're not speculating. She came and did this and then publicized all the documents. So then all the atheists followed it. And we all like watched it happen in real time. Wow, he also is there like a, a post news article on his or YouTube. something? Is there, what what oh, did that yeah. post say? Yeah, he so there's post on his YouTube about him. He like basically admitted, like, yeah, I'm going to jail, you know. And people were like, like saying that they're praying for him, so on and so forth. Uh, did he say why? And then why? his wife. He they already knew they already knew I, why. I, I mean, point. like, from his standpoint, was he like, yeah, I did it, I'm a bad man, or no, it's all false. No, nah, it wasn't. He never, he never came out and was like, uh, at least to this day, as I'm aware, he never came out and was like, I'm repenting about it, just that and the third, or anything like that. But so the so wife, as far as we know, he's still a Muslim? Yeah, he's still a Muslim, as far as we know. Okay, uh, so let me recap real fast and tell me if I'm right. And if someone could link a court article, because I, I, this is the first time hearing of that, I, I would be interested to read a little bit. You know, so I can be objective. But um, so so the gist is, after this, uh, he was abusing his 12-year-old stepdaughter um, before when he was an atheist, uh, oh, good moral atheist. atheist without the belief in a god. So he was abusing his stepdaughter then, and then he found Allah, peace be upon them. And whenever he was a Muslim, he no longer sexually abused um, his stepdaughter. He just abused women the the proper way, um, you know, with like verbal and physically. And then he got caught and went to court and got convicted and went to jail. Is that the gist of it? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so his name is just his real name is Justin Downing. So you could just look up Justin Downing uh abuse case. Dang. Um, you'll see you'll see stuff pop up about Which it. his um, wife has also like we're not saying anything that his wife didn't come out and say publicly in the atheist room. Yeah. A lot of this stuff you can also find on our Facebook uh if uh, Probably not. Probably wants some privacy from this whole thing, but okay. So, yeah, he got he already got his mug shot and stuff. Um, <laughs> so Did really, he have the thing on his head? No, he has glasses, a shaved head, and a beard. He was admitted, or his booking date was May 9th, twenty twenty two, twelve thirty two. Um, let's see. Uh, unlawful, yeah, unlawful sexual conduct with a minor, sexual battery, parent or guardian. Yeah. Dang. You know, I did not expect this one. I, I just thought you'd say, like, the guy's, you know, became a YouTube celebrity and, you know, he didn't have time for the little people of Clubhouse. Like, I did not see that's where uh, this was going. Um, so, well, I mean, you know, I don't want to say because, you know, Christians certainly have their problems too, but, uh, you know, maybe he should have just stuck with Christianity hey, uh, before any of that. Not, not all child molesters are Muslims. 
I know. Like the Sammy Davis had its own. Like the Davis had its own. Ah! <laughs> I'll go first. Christian Kennedy does have his problems, but if there was ever a time to interject that, I feel like it's now. Go ahead, Brandon. So I guess we was just getting crossed up. But yeah, Mike Mojo was with us. I'm just teasing. But no, like uh, like the SBC, uh, they having problems and I. It was even incident in our uh, in the church in one of our movements that uh, they took him to Clown Town though. Like he was uh, that uh, that that little that little pervert was dealt with pretty harshly. The organization was like, bye bye. Uh, well, kind of put a damper on the day. Who's got something happy to talk about? I, I have to be honest. I try to be understanding for a lot of people's struggles and things like that. But I have, I have, and I probably need to work back. Sure, tolerance for like child molesters. Uh, I, I to the to the point like I probably would miss. I don't, I don't want to be seen me, but I probably have to work not to mistreat one in real life. You're saying you would have uh, trouble I, not doing something unchristian. Yeah, like <laughs> you're chopping up really bad. It's this is painful. Uh, yeah, get better reception. Not not to kill the conversation, but yeah, that that reception's rough. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I would just say I'd be tempted not to be nice. to Ah, uh, Brandon, I can't take it. Let me know when you have a, you keep trying and it it's not working, bro. Let me know when you have good reception. I'm happy to bring you back up. But that that is, bless your heart. You're you're like the little engine that keeps trying, but it is it is murdering my ears. Um, let's see, Angie, lady, River, welcome. Any of you would like to say anything? Or Gia, give us an update from the other side of the pond. Hey, what's up, NG? How are you? Are you speaking? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I, I was just, just enjoying the conversation, <laughs> so I'm just going to listen in. Where are you? <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, well, Steph, how do you keep the conversation going? Okay, well... Are you what are, are you back to like working full-time and like regularly now or are you still on on leave or break i am working full-time i am usually listening but i mean i'm here i just can't watch maybe like 60 percent of the time because i'm doing you know stuff i ought to be doing um so some days i can run the room after you go and some days i can't but i am here Oh, was anything about that? I was just wondering if you're like back to full steam. Oh yes, I am back to well. So I'm working Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Chad is working Thursday and Friday. So we're just trying to figure out what works. Like if someone, if one of us is going to stay home with the baby, then both of us are part time, and then we have to go back and forth on that. So yeah, a little tricky. We're figuring it out. Okay, back to uh, back to keeping the conversation going. Hey, Steph and baby Steph. Steph, do you hear her, guys? Listen. I got three questions for Steph. What's up? Well, Steph was well. Steph was in the middle of saying how she's going to keep the conversation going. No, I want to hear Harold's wants. question. Oh, well, okay. I right, had a Harold. question about the chat. We're talking about Beyond Beef price. Stock is down, so it seems like a good time to buy. Uh, but I also want to hear Harold's question. I don't have anything to contribute on the Beyond Beef, so uh, Harold, you're up. <laughs> yeah, so three, three. I mean, if questions. I find it, I'll eat it. Um, <laughs> that, how many kids do you have? I've got three. Okay. I thought she was going to say too many. <laughs> yes, too and many. If you had to describe the the pain and process and experience of childbirth to oh, a man. Boy. How would you describe it? Kidney stones, right? Oh, boy. Okay. I am not the right person to ask because... All right. Let me tell you. So I had... Interesting fact. Apparently, 
you can labor like your own mother or you can labor like your mother-in-law because the labor is actually dictated by the baby. Isn't that interesting? My mom had very long, painful labors. My mother-in-law had more like quick, you know, labors. So all three, I labored like my mother-in-law. They were very brief, but all three were like super intense. Like I went zero to 10 centimeters in under two hours, all three times. And so I never had any medication because there was never any time. So uh, how would I describe it to a man? It's something that you will never, ever understand in your entire life. But the way I would talk to a woman about it would be different. I would sort of coach them on the methods of mental fortitude. So I guess that's a tricky question to answer. Did that, did well, that Harold, help? I would, well, Harold, I would say Steph just gave a bigger response because as everyone knows, you as a man can totally get pregnant now. So I would just say, <laughs> Steph, um, yeah, that's check, true. check your bigotry. Um, oh, I probably, yeah, so yeah, I'd probably, if I was going to throw it in there, it's probably the thing that's going to come close to it is somebody said kidney stones oh, I or, love this no, or, I had, but, but I probably close. not. I said closest. I didn't say that. I didn't say it would match it, Steph. I'm not going to make that yeah, mistake because my wife, my wife would have my head because I have four little ones. She'd have my head if I said something was going to parallel. I'm saying to give you like idea in the direction, not even in the ballpark, but like towards this direction on that side of the spectrum, maybe kidney stones or getting shot in the gut. Here's Where, what like, I say about that though, okay? <laughs> if you're going to describe this to a man, it is a full body, complete, like, it, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. Your entire body, and this, if you get medication, it's different, right? Like my best friend had three really good epidurals and she's like telling jokes while pushing. That was not my experience. Uh, it is such a full body, such an intense, it's not like uh, an injury where then you're hurt and then you have to deal with it. It's like, it comes in waves, there's a rhythm to it. But anyway, your brain goes to another place. You're, it's such a, it's a, it becomes an out of body experience. So it's, it's really hard to try to like compare it to any other injuries or things I've had. Cause it's not the same. Hi, Steph. Hey, Harold, you got How have you been? Hang on last last yeah. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Hang on. God, someone's got to moderate. It may as well be me. You've got two of your questions answered. There are new people though. So Harold, save that third one. Uh, Levi. I want to know why. Uh, what's up, Levi? Is his wife pregnant? Is your wife pregnant? Yes. Uh oh, congrats. Is Levi speaking? Just want to go in order, give everyone their fair shot. Wait, yeah, that wasn't a yes from Harold, just so everyone knows. That was not a yes. Harold's wife is not pregnant. Probably. All right, J and X, Levi is not speaking, so go ahead with asking Steph about her life or whatever that was. Hello, Steph. You may remember me from early Clubhouse days. I hope that Hey, helps. how are you? I know good, you. Good, you good. change your profile so much it's hard to keep up with you. How's it going? Good, good. So I guess as a Christian, right, you see lots of very ungodly things on this app, I'm sure, correct? <laughs> yes. With the arguing and the um insults and everything like that, right? So how do you like go on this app without <laughs> like without like being I guess frustrated and judgmental of the ungodliness that you see on here I hope that yes so I am also ungodly right so um I think the first step to this is recognizing the plank in my own eye I'm not a good person I have done absolutely nothing to achieve my own salvation and so when I see behavior in others, so there's two parts to this, right? We expect different behavior from those under the law. We expect those who are Christians and claiming the name of Christ to behave in a certain way. And we don't expect that from those outside of the faith. So there are sort of two standards that you have to have. So if I'm watching a room of Christians fight, I'm much more frustrated than if I'm watching a room full of not Christians fight, right? Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other is that I'm not good either. In fact, my love for clubhouse drama is probably something that I should uh, work on, but I love it. So yeah, there, does that, does that answer it for you? Yeah. Yeah. We all love, well, it gets tiring after a while. I like it too. There we go. None of us is good. 
<laughs> I'm good. Just joking. <laughs> Let's see. River, what's up? Did you have anything to say this morning? Good morning. I would say I mostly came on the stage because I like to do that because then the people have blocks <clears throat> can't get near me. Um, but <laughs> I would ask, I do have a question, but the problem is I, I feel like I already know at least Nate's answer. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if maybe there's a way you can try and steal man, how someone else would answer. So I'm just curious about the you know how there are some Christians that are like solidly young earth, like it, you know, Adam and Eve was 4,000 years ago, whatever, like, but there are some Christians who seem to be a little loosey goosey on that issue where they're like, Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe God just used evolution as like a mechanism for creating the world or whatever. I'm wondering to what extent is Adam and Eve essential to the Christian philosophy and is there any coherent way to sort of explain Christianity while not believing that Adam and Eve happened? Because it's like, I guess, how else would you ooh, originate ooh, ooh. sin and what role would sin have in that belief system? Well, real quick, uh, River, could you uh, could you give Nate's answer, answer the best you can? And then I will steal man another position by calling on Marquise and Steph. Well, I just feel pretty confident that you would say Adam and Eve is essential to the Christian belief because that's the origin of sin and that also the Bible is true. And if Adam and Eve are not how man originated, then the Bible would not be true and therefore it must be false. All right. Well, it's a toss-up toss -up between Marquise and uh, Steph. You both chimed in. Who wants uh, No, Marquise, take it away. So, yeah, she, she, um, she kind of took the hot air out of my balloon. But, yeah, absolutely that. Um, I think they, they, they are going to have to be essential, um, especially because when we look at scripture, um, we kind of allow the words to speak to us as opposed to telling the words what they say. And what that means is we derive context in terms of whether something is allegorical or literal from the way the words are used, from the way the language is used. Um, and so when we look at accounts like uh, the Genesis account, um, those are written as literal narrative as opposed to allegory like uh the parables of jesus you know where he says like the kingdom of god is like a seed which a man took and planted in the ground that's that's he says like you know so we can derive from there that's a simile that's a metaphor that's allegory um or he says there once was a man who did this right and he's talking about like the rich man and lazarus that's allegory it's clear allegory uh whereas in genesis it's narrative it's totally literal. It's um, it has all of the attributes of a sequence of historical events. Um, and so if we're going to accept uh, I'll use uh, I think it was Nate who said this before, um, which I absolutely love. If we're going to use if we're going to accept that a God that can create all of reality, all of the universe uh, by speaking, if we're going to accept that exists, then we have to accept the or it's easier to accept these smaller premises like he made humans as completely functional organisms by forming them from the dirt. Well, if he can create matter itself, then yeah, making Adam and Eve in a garden fully functioning without having to evolve, you know, some four, 6,000 years ago is totally within the realm of his capability. Um, and so it speaks to the inerrancy of scripture, as you said, uh, and then also uh, it fundamentally explains uh, the the problem of evil, where evil comes from, where we come from, the origins of everything. Uh, and so it's a necessary aspect of uh, Christian thought, for sure. I can, I can comment on this as well. So um, the Bible is ancient history. I think everyone would agree on that. And it, things in the Bible were, not writ were kind of not written as they happened. They were written like a few years usually afterwards, right? So there's certain things that people at the time that was written would have picked up on being a metaphor because it's like it was relevant to them. And like there were cultural contexts that would have existed for them that wouldn't exist for us. So for example, right? Early civilization when Genesis was written was a farmer society, if that makes sense. 
So when he says um, on, on the X amount of day he created rain or whatever, people would have picked up on that and said as probably as a metaphor because they would have had to have had a good understanding of the rain cycles. So it's like stuff like that. Um, Not sure Steph, that I was gonna, answers the question. Uh, well, I was going to ask Steph, because, uh, yeah, River, it's it's pretty, like, in traditional understanding, like, there, there's going, there's not really a way to get around a literal Adam and Eve. Um, I think, like, with, with, which is why I think most people on stage are going to default to Adam and Eve have to be literal. I was going to ask Steph if, if she wanted to be the, the devil's advocate and, and walk it back, like, you know, as loose as you possibly could. Um if you want to, if you want to do that, but I mean, you know, you can have other interpretations about ages and stuff like that. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, but uh, I mean, there has to be in some way, shape, or form a literal Adam and Eve. But Steph, did you want to, you want to see if you can like, yeah, give us the uh, loosest interpretation that Chris won't cast you into outer darkness for? The loosest. Well, I'll give you my position first. There are a couple reasons we have to have a literal Adam and Eve. So one is exactly the the tale of, and I think there is some flexibility within the tale, um, but this the story of how sin came to be in Genesis, um, we're referring to specific people, Adam and Eve. And then Adam is referred to later in the Bible as an archetype for man, right? So the use of this name changes, but the initial story is pretty clear. So that's one reason. The other reason is that there has to be a lineage that goes straight from Adam to Christ um, because it's so well documented. And especially as Jinx was saying, it's so well documented, even in um, the context, even um, relative to other ancient historical documents, there is such well documented lineage from Adam to Christ that um, there's something anomalous there uh, in terms of like ancient history. And then the third thing I would say to answer your question, River, I mean, you had a few in there, but you had opened with creationism. So I'm personally an old earth creationist. I do not hold to new earth creationism, although it's not a hill I would die on. I am perfectly happy if I get there and God told me that the earth was created in seven literal, six literal days and that's it. I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. Like that doesn't impact my faith at all. The thing that makes most sense to me though is old earth creationism. So that being said, um, you can hold to either young earth or old earth creationism. The only thing you really need to hold to is the literal, um, the timeline between Adam and Christ. So now steel manning the other side, what, what are you asking me to do to, to loosen that up? And, and sure. let me just, okay. Let, yeah. me give, let me give some context. So I guess for me, like, I don't know. I kind of feel like my life would be a lot easier if I could believe in God. And so I feel like to a certain extent for the last few years, I've been like trying, like I've been giving it a fair shot. Like, okay, like if I was going to believe in God, like what, what are the things I would need to be proven to me? And one of them is the miracles of Christ being true. Um, and then the other one is I just find the concept of Adam and Eve so preposterous that I, and especially young earth creationism to be so preposterous that like, you know, as the person who studied evolutionary biology in, in college, it's just like, Ooh, I don't know. There's just no way. So I'm just trying to find maybe a version <laughs> of this whole thing yeah. that could fit within my schema. Okay. I understand what you're saying now. So there are scientists who would have been able to teach at the university you got your degree from and also hold fully to the Christian faith and the um, inerrant uh, understanding of the Bible. And so then the question becomes how, like, how do people do that? Um, and it's because a couple things. So one, like Jinx was saying before, the, these are ancient documents. So when we're studying ancient literature, we look at them in an ancient context. We look at them in relation to other um, ancient texts, right? So we have a whole bunch of anomalies in the Bible, such as, for example, the order of creation uh, ends up being remarkably sound. Um, so that's anomalous, right? We're not talking about earth being on the back of a turtle, or we're not talking about other, you know, there are so many other creation myths. And, it, you know, the, the way the Bible lays it out allows for so much flexibility and interpretation that even like, just for example, if we look back at the Catholic Church really needing to hold to the geocentric model of, um, of the solar system, right? 
And then when the heliocentric model came along and they were all upset about it, it didn't actually contradict the Bible at all. It was like a tradition problem, not a um, not a biblical problem. So when we see these revelations come along in science, they don't undo what the Bible says. So what we have with this text, with the text, our creation story, um, it is never undone by scientific revelation, which is sort of amazing. So there's so much to go into here. Um, but I could, if you're interested, I could give you some resources that would comfortably, uh, like, you don't have to sacrifice your scientific mind to be a Christian, is what I'm saying. And I think that's the most harmful belief ever, that you have to choose one or the other. So, yeah, if you want to go deeper into that, I'd love to love to talk more there. Yeah, feel yeah, free to back channel me. Yeah, I mean, I would say for ease, uh, you know, for like a ease of belief, um, easy doesn't make it true or false. But I mean, you know, to assuage to, to assuage your kind of reconciling everything. Basically, I think the, the lowest com or the lowest uh, bar in Christianity is it, it comes down to a soul. That's why people like aside from you know we actually believe it, but the reason why it's important is it all hinges on a soul and like you know humanity. And Adam is like you know we've already talked about like you know the the stand-in for all of humanity. So it, it all centers on on this soul, like this human soul um, that God gives us. So that's the part that, you know, we believe is going to live forever. Um, so if someone could probably come up with a way, like not even theistic evolution that doesn't believe in Adam and Eve literally, but as long as, as long as like, you know, you, you could probably believe in lots of other stuff, changing into other stuff over time. And that's great. I mean, we would, people would argue, but theologically speaking, um, it's not like a, a salvation issue. It's not a theological problem other than people would say it's just incorrect. So if you want to say like, you know, stuff changes and other stuff, but as a one-off or for whatever reason, God hand planted, uh, you know, the existence of a human with a soul. And that's what started, you know, uh, this life. That would be like the lowest bar in Christianity that I think would, um, would not be like any kind of like salvation problem. Cause then you don't get into like, you know, Adam being the first man and Jesus being like the second Adam who didn't sin, because that would be a problem if there's not a literal Adam with a soul. So um, I would say that. So the bar is pretty low, and that makes it pretty easy to believe. Um, again, it doesn't speak whether or not it's true, but it makes it easy to, uh, it, it's like an easy bar to meet. Yeah, it's funny you say that because a lot of the reason why I'm like kind of wishing that I could believe in God is because I'm so thoroughly convinced in the lack of a soul. And when you don't believe in the soul, then it has some really complicated implications and like for me it's not for me the eternal life issue what happens when we die that part is not the issue like honestly I find a finite life to be somewhat more comforting like it's just a complete lack of awareness at some point when we die like that to me that almost more comforting than eternal life uh, you're matrixing a bit it's scary but when you are on the game that is self illusion and there is no soul, it has some complicated implications for like, well, what is my agency? You know, why do I even make the decisions that I make? You know, like, am I just like a fleshy robot at this point, basically? You know, like, it does have some, and it, so I often describe it to people that I love um, with with respect to my mental health. As paper, in a way, as a wallpaper of reality, kind of goes away from me sometimes, and I actually start to get into a really anxious state about feeling like nothing is real, like that it's all just kind of like this, you know, you know that I'm just like I'm just eyes in the back of a head. You know what I mean? So anyway, that I find that thought very troubling, and so I'm like trying to find some comfort, but. Um, I just find certain aspects of Christianity to be so preposterous that it's like hard for me to get to the point, you know, and I, and I can't, and I agree that just because something's easy or hard doesn't make it true or false. But for me, when I use those terms, I mean like how easy or hard is it to be convinced, you know, like of its, of its truth. I understand. I would yeah. say that uh, the Adam is a historical person, 
And if he's not, we would lose uh, several things. And I think River touched on it when she first started talking that, uh, you know, there would be no fall without Adam, but <clears throat> we'd lose a lot of things there, you know, without Adam, there would be no Edenic covenant of works or there would be no Adamic covenant of grace. There would be no Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus uh, believed that Adam existed in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, if Jesus is God, you know, that lends veracity to the existence of Adam as a historical person. You know, the but there's a lot of things that we would lose uh, that's uh, vital to the Christian faith. You know, it's... Uh, because uh, one thing I often say is that uh, we can prove the Bible is true because of fulfilled prophecy, you know, in the proto-evangelium and or the promise of the uh, coming Messiah in Genesis, uh, you know, would be something that we lose. We would lose a prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that would minus uh, one of our evidences that the Bible is true. And uh, another thing I often talk about is uh, in argumentation that uh, uh, a positive argument can't be uh, dismissed by a negative argument. You know, uh, uh, the God, I mean, the Adam is a historical person. And then someone say, well, no, it's allegory. Well, you know, that would be a negative argument compared to being a historical argument that uh, Adam existed, you know, and. It may be true that it's allegory, but uh, Jesus thought Adam was a historical person. So this is a positive that cannot be washed away by any negative argument that you can come up with. And uh, River, I think you know. Let me let me. If you're looking for something preposterous, let me maybe complicate things for you a little more. Um, instead of you know Adam and Eve and you know whatever happened there, I'd say would it be more or less? And it's rhetorical. It's more, um, in my humble opinion preposterous that you know a divine being a god who created a bunch of you know messed up humans to do a bunch of messed up stuff um even against his own creation like you know murder rape war famine all these evils um god's creation have visited upon other of god's creation um you know and god declares you know he says look i'm the potter you're the clay i can do whatever i want with you all i could like scrub you from existence if i wanted to um and if i were god everyone would be thankful i'm not I probably would just be like, yeah, to the trash, all of you. But um, it seems a little preposterous, but lucky for us that this God still uh, died for us. So to have our creator and then we thumb our face, like thumb our finger in the face of our creator and do all these like terrible human things. And we still have this God who wants to reconcile us to himself, dies for us and uh, says, all you got to do is exercise some faith dare to believe I exist, I actually care a little bit about you, and I will give you an eternal existence that is blissful and amazing, because I care that much for you, you messed up little creation. Um, and I would submit that that is pretty preposterous, um, but also true. So if that's true, I really don't care about anything else. Um, you know, talking snake, talking donkey, wonderful. Um, you know, do they lack the vocal structure? Was this a one-off that had the proper vocal structure? Was it a magical horn behind their head? Don't know, don't care. Um, in some way, I believe it happened. Uh, but yeah, I'd say that's the hardest thing to believe, that like a God that you know makes us, we do everything to try to get this God to hate us and destroy us. Yet this God is like, let me go ahead and make things right and die for you. So um, don't know if that helps or complicates, but that's pretty preposterous. And that's the ultimate theme of the Bible that, uh, you know, God died for a bunch of undeserving, messed up humans. So yeah, cheers. I mean, that part in and of itself sounds a little preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, why not just set up a system that doesn't require you to kill your only son? Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to open a whole new can of worms. No, that's I fine. Appreciate but I mean, you the know, time you've taken already. Oh, sure. But I mean, you know, to be accurate to the story, no one kills him. You know, Jesus says, no one takes his life, he lays it down, and he picks it up again, you know, just to be accurate. But, you know, like we talked about earlier, like the ease of a belief, the ease of something, doesn't make it true or false. Um, you know, the same thing, like, you know, the preposterousness of an argument, argument doesn't make it true or false. But truly, if it happened, it happened. Um, so, 
Anyway, I always appreciate your uh, questions and your time being here with us. Let us know if you got anything else. I think also, River, um, the because I know that you've been sniffing around this for a while, and I love it. Um, there are people who think the way you do who have been convinced, right? Like I said, the thing about your college professors could have taught you what they taught you and also comfortably been Christians. So then since there are perfectly healthy people of sound mind not struggling with cognitive dissonance uh, who believe both what you've been taught and the Bible, there must be answers that you're missing. So I would encourage you to continue seeking and continue researching. Um, and I have drawn faith uh, and good information from both Christian and secular sources. But since you're well steeped in secular sources already, I would encourage you to look up some Christian resources and see what the what the reconciliation is there on the other side. Um, for me, the biggest sway and and what Nate said is exactly correct. Of course, like it, there's an element of faith that can't be replaced. You can't logic yourself perfectly into Christianity. You can logic yourself into the plausibility of Christianity, but then a personal relationship of with God is the hinge of the whole thing, right? So you're going to hit that point either way. Um, but in terms of feeling more comfortable with the plausibility of Christianity, for me, the, uh, the convincer was history. Um, looking at how ancient documents were written and how these documents were written, how ancient documents are preserved and how these documents were preserved, how things are recorded um, and how astronomically uh, unlikely it is, like how statistically impossible it is that the Bible exists the way it does in terms of um, especially relative to other historical documents. So I don't know how interested you are in history, but that's what did it for me. I'm sure there's a similar path through the sciences. Um yeah, so I would just tell you to keep keep looking, keep searching. You're always asking the good questions, and and as Christians, we shouldn't shy away from the tough questions because uh, God is is the inventor of all of this anyway. It's us trying to find out how God did it, right? So yeah, River, keep it up. Yeah, I mean, one and thank you, Steph. But like, yeah, one of the because I have tried before, right? I've tried to find good information from Christian resources and stuff, but usually what ends up happening is I'll find a piece of evidence that I'm like, wait, what? No, this is not right. Like basically a, a point at which they clearly don't have the same understanding that I do, you know, like um, that then it causes me to question all the credibility from that source. Cause I'm like, well, wait, if they don't understand this thing, then how can I trust them to understand the rest of it? So yeah. I'm sure there's some like, I don't know, negative confirmation bias there but yeah it does get tricky you know when it's like you're you're listening to this person speak and you're like oh okay yeah yeah yeah, that makes sense okay okay and then they say something that like I don't know I don't have like an example or like um an analogy to a different set of beliefs but like um I don't know it'd be like well I was gonna make a statistical analogy but I guess I don't know. Not everyone here is a statistician, so that wouldn't make sense would... either. But basically, they just say something that just so clearly demonstrates a fundamental lack of understanding of the subject matter that I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay. I want to respond to that really quick. Yep. Um, River, when you're walking through the grocery store, just about in your daily life, how many people in the grocery store have your level of expertise in statistics or biology? I would expect zero on a given right. day. <laughs> so if you are seeking out these, because you're past 101 level, right? Like 101 Christianity is like, why, uh, you know, like, why did Jesus die? Why did God create evil? Like, you know, you are, you're way, we're in the master's level here with you <laughs> because you're very familiar. So you're going to have to seek out some master's level information on this, which means that you can't come into the grocery store and expect that like maybe there'll be one or two or three people there who can answer your question. So if you're relying on um, information, like if you're Googling for answers on this really difficult, like how are, how is what I understand of the age of the earth and, uh, and the Bible, the biblical creation story, how are those reconciled? You're going to have to go to some very specific specialists because your pastor on the street is not going to have uh, an answer for that, that will satisfy you because your level of understanding of the sciences is so much further than, so again, we're dividing this in. We're not talking about the faith of the thing. We're talking about the logic of the thing. And so you're going to have to do some legwork to seek out the specialists who have the level of skill that you're looking for. Well, I mean, I don't want to be super lame right now, but 
I guess I'm going to. I mean, instead of seeking out, you know, master's level, eh, say it with me, seek out the master. But I mean, that's, I mean, it sounds lame, but I mean, I don't think it's wrong. Like, at a certain point, like, you know, whenever you get, like, super, like, academic people of other religions or whatever, and, you know, all they do is, like, debate into idiocy, like, at a certain point, you know, a YouTube video is not going to do it. Like, any argument you're going to find, you're going to be able to find an argument to talk you out of it just the same. So, I mean, there's no shortage of that. So, like, at some point, and I don't mean this rough, I mean, this is just kind of my general stance, like, you know, at a certain point, stop talking to pastors, stop looking at YouTube videos, stop looking at scholarship, you've already done that. Like, pray to God. And I said, I know you said you used to be a Christian. I'm sure you've done that too. But I would say that's going to ultimately be where everything, you know, everything like any answer you want is going to come from seeking God directly. Like any, any natural knowledge, sure, take it in. Maybe you'll uncover a rock you haven't, you know, you haven't uncovered before, but it's just going to keep you down this line of like human wisdom, which isn't bad if you're, di unless you're discounting, you know, God for pursuit of human argumentation. So I would say, you know, definitely pray to the guy you're actually questioning whether or not exists and cares. Wait, I, real quick, because I don't want to be misunderstood. I would absolutely agree with 100% of what you just said. Uh, I think what I'm speaking to with River is the specific task of coming out of academia, coming with the academic background and having to reconcile logically. Like, yes, faith surpasses all understanding. And that's a crucial element. But I feel like you don't sometimes with this, you have to get a person to the point where they desire to have that faith. Um, if they're in the point where they don't even think it's possible that that faith exists, well, you have a, um, like a mental, it's, it's a mental problem. It's mental doubt. It's, it's intellectual doubt, right? So I'm not telling like, yes, everything Nate told you is the most sound advice and that's the correct answer. But there also needs to be a desire to receive those answers from the Lord and an understanding that it's possible to have that kind of relationship with the Lord. So now I'm at the point in my faith where I'm like, yeah, this stuff is interesting to read about, but I'm not hinging anything on it anymore because I've been convinced and I have a personal relationship with my creator who answers all questions satisfactorily, right? But I didn't start there. I started with having to overcome the academic, the intellectual doubt. So yes, Nate is 100% correct, but I, I think I was speaking to something slightly more specific. than. I mean, gotcha. I wasn't Thank you. you out, but if you have a guilty conscience, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't want <laughs> anyone Seriously to think not. that I'm saying that you can't arrive at this by faith. You 100% <laughs> can arrive at this by faith. But academic tradition in the way it is now presents certain hurdles that I, uh, that I know can be overcome through other... Um, like if you have an academic mind and those things are exciting to you, they can bring you, you know, cleanly into the faith as well. So it's not like strictly a faith issue. I guess. Rick came up uh, to talk up, about Rick? it. Yeah. Rick real. What's up? Hey guys, how you doing? Good, good. Yeah. I was just, this was an interesting conversation and, uh, I kind of, uh, assessed, I just, you know, I just recently came into the room and I was like, this must be a, a discussion about science and the scripture and uh i put a comment in the chat saying it's, it's a it's a it's a uh example of a classic false dichotomy and i think because of the uh, the results of liberal theology and its attempts to mythologize the entire scripture that uh, uh we live in a, in a in a in a time now where we see this Verses between science and scripture, when in reality there really isn't a uh, a, a, a contradiction or or, or a uh, battle going on there. And so, in specific, if we consider the question of origins and uh, in the book of Genesis, in the opening chapters there, the idea of seeing that um, through the lens of scientific. Uh, I guess questions being answered would, would be to misunderstand Moses. And so um, I don't think that there is a, a sense in which you can, you can see a conflict between the two because science is not giving answers that the scripture can give. And I think when, when we try to think that science can give those types of answers, then we're not talking about science anymore. We're, we're, we're talking about things that are outside the scope of science. All science does is observe the things that God actually did. 
that's all they can do. When they try to give answers as to purpose, uh, origination, uh, and things like that, then, 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 then we're outside the scope of science. And I think that's where we, we get into this, this tussle <clears throat> because we think that science can do those things and it and actually cannot. It can only just observe what has been done. Um, and whatever has been done was done by God. And so that, that's, that's, that's where we are right there. And I think a, a very good book, I think it was Sister River, um, a very good book that might help you is uh, by, uh, by the man named of, uh, John, Dr. John Walton. He wrote a book called uh, The Lost World of Genesis 1. And he wrote another book called The Lost World of Adam and Eve. And if you read those two books, he's, a, he's an Old Testament professor. He's not a scientist. But his thesis is that the opening chapters of Genesis are not in conflict with, with science. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to just take a look at that book. Yeah, at, at the end of the day there, River, it's about authority and epistemology. And so, you know, the idea that, that you're saying that the idea of Adam and Eve is preposterous, that's not coming from the facts that you learned. It's coming from a conclusion about those facts and a conclusion about epistemology. And so what you have to do is kind of back yourself away from why you think those things are preposterous to why you, why you think those things are preposterous. Do you see what I'm saying? Why do you, why are you looking at these things as preposterous? That's, that's, that's the thing. It's an epistemological conflict and authority conflict, not, not a science conflict. If that makes sense. Uh, you have any final thoughts, River? No, I mean, all, all good food for thought. I think it's just one of those things where it's just challenging, you know, because you're, <laughs> when it's like, it's not just, it's not just like one thing. It's not just like, oh man, this, uh, this one fossil is really throwing me off. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like this really complex system of information with lots of different like okay well if i accept this then how do i reconcile this and then that and then this it's like a chain reaction you know what i mean um and this is where i i've talked about this in this space before but i just really wish that i could have been alive when jesus was alive and seen the miracles he performed because i don't know i'm just such a see it to believe it person and so if i had been there i just feel like i would have been like oh okay and then i would have just found a way to reconcile everything else. But because of that, I'm just like constantly dealing with this, like, well, I don't know. Look at the way people write stories down today. Sometimes it's like, they really get the facts wrong or they exaggerate or people can be de deceived or whatever. So I don't know. I'm just jealous of all those people that got to actually see it. Wait, so this is well, exactly I what I was saying about mm -hmm. like the way that we write stories down today is one thing and the way that they did it in an ancient understanding was very different and one of the most convincing this goes very deep but one of the most convincing elements of the bible is the way that it corroborates across cultures and languages and times that had no connection with each other right so if we saw I, okay I, that's a whole other thing but i would encourage you to look into that because it's definitely different from the way that we would understand it today um and then you said something else that i wanted to it's not just one fossil Shoot. Oh my gosh. I had something else I was going to respond to. I'll think of it. And I, I mean, I appreciate that, you know, we all would have liked to have been there, but keep in mind, there were a lot of people who were there and they still didn't believe That's it. the only difference That's between say. the only difference. Oh, Oh, no. the only difference between them is they weren't in a position to say, Oh, you don't exist. This didn't happen because they were watching it right in front of their faces. Um, so what did they do? They didn't just say, well, I saw it, so I believe. They said, I saw it, well, I guess the devil's real and the devil's doing it. So, you know, no matter what kind of advantage or disadvantage we perceive we have, like, you know, seeing is believing. Uh, well, it's believing in something, apparently the devil, instead of the guy telling you he's God doing it right in front of you. Um, so, you know, no one would be immune. So even if we were alive back then, uh, there's a very good chance that, you know, I don't know, half of this room um, would have been like, no, no, I, I believe, you know, whatever just happened, because I can't deny it, but it totally wasn't uh, this guy Jesus claiming to be God. It was the devil. Um, 
So again, I feel like I may be complicating things more than helping you, but you know, if you want <laughs> yeah, hopefully accurate me, answers. The idea that there were some people that didn't believe is honestly like, well, okay, so you're telling me there was somebody there that saw Jesus heal There's people, a lot of people. Yes. And then didn't believe it, then I'm like, okay, well, clearly it must not have been that convincing. Wait, okay, so the well, Bible well, no, it was convinced well, to this, and it says that these miracles were performed right in front of people, and they didn't believe it. It's a, it's, it's talking about a very sound um, principle in human psychology. It's not. It's talking about how it doesn't matter whether we live in 2023 and haven't held Christ's hand physically versus like this human psychological phenomenon occurs no matter when. So this is kind of a is it ends up being sort of a useless thought like, oh, well, if I was there and I saw Lazarus raised, I would believe. Well, no, because human psychology has this problem where 50 percent of them didn't believe and they attributed it to other things or they convinced themselves that it was a trick or like they're, they're doing the exact same thing that you're doing right now. So the Bible speaks to that, not to, do you see what I mean? Like there's a yeah, universal. It's, it's so much worse than that stuff. It's so much worse. They did believe they saw it. They believed and they plotted to murder him. Okay. Well, yeah. So, so there's the that difference. As well, because of political dynamics, right? Yeah. And it wasn't and political dynamics. Problems. It was, yeah, it was, it was heart problem because the, the whole thing is that they did believe just like the demons did and they plotted to murder him it says it over and over and over in the scripture and so it is a blessing that you did not live in the first century because given your state right now of unbelief that means that you would have been one of those people who plotted to murder him after having seen withered hands people raised from the dead all of these amazing miracles that's the point and so God has given grace to us that we don't live in that time because we would stand condemned. Yeah, I mean, it's true because there are some, like, okay, like, do you guys ever see those videos on, okay, two things. Because one, I've seen them in real life because I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tim's story. He's like a kind of like a California um, charismatic Christian pastor. He's, I don't know. Um, he's on this app sometimes, but I was very close with him in my family. But anyway, like, so I've seen this in real life and I've also seen videos where someone will be like, we have a miracle that was recorded on video, like evidence of God, whatever. And then like you watch it and you're like, well, I don't know. I mean, I feel like this could have been staged or, you know, whatever. Or like, for example, Tim's story, he used to do this thing where he would send the power of the Holy Spirit into you where he'd like snap his fingers and then he'd point to you and then people would like pass out, you know? And I had that done to me and I did pass out. I did. I like, he, he was like, boom. And then I like passed out. Um, and I'm like now convinced that he just uses the techniques of hypnotism. Um, <laughs> so 100%. I, suppose it's, Correct. I suppose it's true that like if I can watch these things and be in the same way skeptical, I suppose there's no reason I couldn't have watched Jesus perform miracles and been the exact same level of skeptical. They would have been a completely different level. Okay, the, the quote-unquote miracles that charismatics do today are not even remotely, remotely close to what Jesus did. Not even remotely close. Like, they're doing parlor tricks and hypnotism Jesus is literally regrowing limbs in front of people's faces, like literally regrowing limbs in front of their faces. He's raising people from the dead that have been dead for days that everyone knows is dead. There was no magic or parlor tricks. These things were obviously real. Not can, can I, uh, do you mind if I ask a question? Because sure. uh, do you mind if I, yeah, because I know up? this is a Christ, Christian room, so I don't want to offend anyone, but. I'm just trying to understand your reasoning here because there were many different religions at that time, were they not? Where they believed in gods who worked miracles, etc. So I don't sure, think their were... faith, you know, their, their ability to perceive and believe in the unreal, I don't think it was missing, right? So if they had seen Jesus do all these things, I, mean, I, I just think it's a really, really um, crazy thing to accuse these people of, like, what the, all the Jews at that time were just completely idiots. 
If somebody no, raises that's not what the, the scripture says. The scripture is clear. I know what it the scripture it. says. I, oh, you I do? Quote it for well, me. Go ahead. Hang on. No, I mean, before, just, we, before we before we like jump off a cliff with no parachute, Ben. To be accurate, it doesn't say all the Jews were dumb. It's I mean the first followers of Christ, including Christ, were Jews. So there were Jews who recognized the Messiah and the miracles and the divinity of Jesus, and they followed him. There were also Jews who did not. The same goes for Gentiles. So that's what the scripture says, and it was Jewish people who wrote this about Jews, by the way. So continue. Would you say that – okay, so would you say that it sounded like, like you were saying the majority of them wanted to kill Jesus? Uh, Chris was speaking. It was the religious so, ruling class primarily, yes. and then all the crowd that joined them. Right. Okay. So it was, was the, the, it was a large majority of people that were plotting to murder Jesus, yes. And if you had lived in that time, you would be re right in on the plot. I, I I doubt it. You know, if somebody could raise, I'd I'd bring him and get him to raise my family members first before I even think about killing someone like that. No, Don't you that's, think that's, 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 what, you that's not what the Bible. Yeah, that's that, that's the point. The Bible literally says the opposite. Oh, no. Okay. I have a well, so you, question. Okay, so so I I was just trying to get at your reasoning. It sounds to me like you're just fully committed to your belief on the Bible, and you know, if the Bible says it this way, then it must have happened this way. Correct, because I, we're fully committed to the belief in the resurrection of Christ. So if you want to okay. see, and I was going to tell River this, if you want one thing to attack instead of multiple other things, the one thing to look at is going to be the resurrection of Christ. And so if mm -hmm. Christ raised from the dead, then everything he said must be true. Period. Okay. End of story. Okay. Okay. And do we have any evidence outside the Bible that people saw him? Why? Why do you yes. need it outside Before the Bible? It was the... Yes, but but it why? Why would you need it? It doesn't matter. The Bible is just a collection of historical documents, and so well, to I... say that you're to say that you're trying to say, oh, I need something outside the Bible, that's begging the question. It's a logical fallacy. So well, stop no, with the logical fallacies and look at the historical documents written about the event. Yeah, well, it's not a logical fallacy because he's the Bible says he fed five thousand. It says that he fed five thousand people with loads of fish and bread, right? Unless you think that's an allegory, which makes more sense to me. But no, I assume it's you not take an that allegory. Story literally. I take it literally. Okay, so you, but so again, you, so you take it literally. So, so why again, did nobody mention that? Again, it's a logical fallacy because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get enemies of the gospel to write positive things about the gospel. It's simply not going to happen. They're just not going to mention it, or they're just going to, or they're going to lie about it. I mean, are you joking? Like it's a, it's a, your burden of proof is ridiculous. They're, you're asking for a burden of proof that literally no one else in the world has asked for for any other historical document. What do you mean? No, we, we, I mean, the Muslims, they say that Muhammad went up on a white horse and that he went through the seven heavens. And they say that Muhammad blew up the moon and all this stuff. We question them, you know, it, and in African, the, the, the difference is we take our mysteries and our scriptures allegorically and mythically, whereas you take them as literal fact. So I, I don't think it's a false. I'm not trying to, you know, I think it's a pretty reasonable question. This is one of the most documented periods in human Wait, history. Wait, what was the question? And, oh, oh, well, yeah, your, well, your question is simple. Like extra biblical books, like they got all the books that talked about a subject, and that's why it's the Bible. So none of these books were the Bible. These were all independent authors with independent writings. And at a certain point, they're like, hey, let's take all the collections of stuff from all these people about the subject of Jesus, and let's put them in a consolidated work. And we're going to call this the Bible. So there was no Bible. You've got evidence you want, even though you're saying extra biblical. It was all extra biblical. There was no Bible. So they're all independent works from independent authors. We just organized them um, over time, and now it's collected. Well, I think the scholars would disagree with you. that I don't think that Matthew, Mark, and Luke actually wrote the, the, the books. Well, so so go disabuse Wait, yourself well, of ignorance instead of just put, making claims. Why don't you actually go and do the scholarship yourself because you'll find something different. Well, hang, hang I mean, on. I've read a little bit. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Hang, hang on. Ben, Ben, hang on. Mm -hmm. Let's try to be a go. little more palatable. So, Ben, what you just said has nothing to do with what I said. I didn't talk about authorship at all. I just said, unless you think, I mean, one guy with, you know, entirely different writing styles. But I'm not even talking about the different authors. I'm just saying these were all independent works. So it doesn't matter the specific author unless you're saying the, there was only one author with wildly different writing styles. 
So as long as you're not saying it's one guy who wrote all these books, well, then what you said has nothing to do with what I'm saying. I'm just saying they were all different independent accounts, regardless of which author specifically. And they all said different and they all talked about the life of Christ. That, that was my point. I mean, if what you want to talk about authorship, that's an entirely mm -hmm. different category. Well, if it's if it just came from one person, then they they're not all independent, right? They they like like for example, we know we know the New Testament was put together by Marcion. Marcion is the one who sat down and collected all these books. He collected that's completely the letters of Paul. stupid, and that's completely ignorant. I'll no, that's just the historical. Love of no, no, I'm that's just I'm just mentioning historical fact. He created the first New Testament canon. Well, if Marcion. it's a historical fact, make sure it's actually a fact. It is a fact. This is something that I learned from studying. Even Gary Habermas admits that the, Marcion was the first person to collect the books into a New Testament. But again, you okay. keep moving. Like, I don't even know if this qualifies as moving the goalposts. It's like moving the field to another planet. Like, what no. does it matter? Like, like, what does it matter but, who, who but, went around? Hold on. What does it matter who went around with a horse and cart and gathered up all the collections? That could have been me. It could have been you. Like, who cares? Like, it could have been anyone. Like, the person who gathered these books, that what does that have anything to do? Like the fact is, all these works were gathered. Like, who cares who did it? So why are you? Are, it's like you're you're shifting the whole field somewhere far, far away. I'm trying to say that these are not all independent. They all come from the same source. That's what I'm. Okay, trying to then say. you're the only person. Like there are ardent, militant anti-theists um, who would not agree with you. Like the most ardent anti-theist who has every reason to pick apart Christianity would never say that. They would say something like, we don't know which author or is a different author. No one except you I've ever heard in my life or read about would say that the entire Gospels, the entire New Testament or whatever you're saying was written by one author. Like that's that's a way to be disaccepted by other people who have a bone to pick and hate Christianity is to say one author wrote them all. No one. I think that. The, well, I think the the from what I've studied the the, the, the <laughs> gospels, the synoptic gospels, and I know I'm going on. So if anyone wants to jump in, and and because I I don't want to take up too much space, but the, the the four synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they they are all basically saying that's why they call synoptic gospels. They're all saying the same thing. There, there aren't and four it, uh, synoptic gospels. There's three and, synoptic gospels. I said I said I said three. Didn't I say three? I said synoptic and I said Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You said four, then you said three, but yes, go ahead. Okay, my mistake, my mistake. I'm trying to say these three books, excluding John, um, they, they all say the same thing, basically. And the historical consensus is they all come from one source. They say that that source is Q. Some people say that that source is Marcion. Marcion said that he had his own gospel. It was called the Evangelicon. So that's, I was just trying to say that these are not all, they were not written by independent authors who all had different accounts and all these different people. I mean, <laughs> Justin Martyr doesn't even mention these people. It doesn't mention Mark, doesn't mention Luke, doesn't mention John. Which is which is strange, don't you think? Uh, no, everything you're saying is is factually incorrect, and I don't understand why we're even entertaining it. Like, please go get educated, and then bring sources if you're going to make claims. Can I ask Ben one question, Ben? Ben, um, which which gospel has the ascension in it? Which gospel has the ascension? And I just want to make sure you've actually read it. Which gospel has the ascension? I think all all three of them. No, you've never read them. You've never read them. Go read them again. Go, go, that's like a fourth grade level question. Come on. But I, I mean, let me help you. In the book of Mark, I mean, in the book of Mark, there's only one that talks about the ascension. Go read it, it again for it, yourself. Please. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter at this point. Um, and I would like to, you know, talk to some of the other people. But um, Ben, I would say, you know, gosh, I have a bad way of helping. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm like how how people used to like cure crazy people by doing things that would make a sane person crazy. Maybe it's like the theological equivalent of that. But instead of like, you know, making your case that the whole Bible, you know, that the Gospels all say the same thing. Well, the entire New Testament says the same thing. It's not like it says something different than the Gospels. All it does is repeat over and over and over, which, by the way, if it was only one person, they would have wrote one, maybe two books to back it up. And they're like, all right, done. There's no reason for the same author to write the exact same thing. So if you get around to reading the Gospels, keep on reading to the other epistles and the other books in the New Testament. It is just redundancy upon redundancy. It's all saying the same thing. So that extends your argument beyond just the, the gospel saying the same thing. The whole New Testament says the same thing over and over and over. Um, anyways, don't know if that helps or hurts, but uh, Theo, what's up? Welcome. Hi, uh, good, good to see you, Nate, uh, Chris, and everybody in Victoria. 
Um, but yeah, so I guess uh, my, my question uh, is, is for Victoria. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, if she would go out with me, if she would court, uh, if I could court her, uh, seek her. Okay. Oh, crap. Theo, you Theo, Theo, stop. Oh my gosh. Is Victoria even here? She is. Oh, oh, there she is. Sorry, Victoria. Yeah, I thought I, I, I didn't recognize the profile picture. You changed. We're gonna have to. I thought you were gonna have to ban Theo if he does. Yeah, it. yeah. So Theo, um, you know, last time I didn't know what was going on. Now I, I, I thought it was kind of like a joke. Apparently, it was not. Um, so yeah, man, that's making everyone super uncomfortable. Um, just I, I don't know what to say. Uh, get a goldfish, bro. Um, not, not in this room. Um. That's crazy. Yeah. I've never so heard I want to. I want to be uh, other than abortion before. That's wild. That's the first time I've ever heard him talk about anything other than abortion. Yeah, I mean, I want to be respectful to all everyone's feelings. I like Victoria. I like Theo, and as much as I know you, but uh, yeah, bro, not not here. Um, you know, I recently adopted a puppy. Um, maybe that would give you companionship. Um, I know I I enjoy my puppy. Um, so, anyways, Stephen, what's up? How are you? I, I'm fantastic. I, I I I was um I I'm I'm looking forward to um uh, I, I here's here's the question I, I was gonna I was gonna ask ask you Nate and uh, and Chris is um uh, biblical focus you know so um he, here's here's what uh, I, I was having this this discussion of going you know through the Bible full front to back continuously or um. Uh, a topically reading, like say a book of the Bible at, the time, at a time. And, and then what you focus on, like wherever you focus, that seems like what, what tends to be um, shows up on, in, on other things. So here's my, here's my question. What are your thoughts and, and Chris's thoughts on, on uh, I'd like so many anybody's thoughts on, what are your thoughts on the memorization of scripture as a general thing, like memorization of scripture in, in general, because I, I've thought about which ones to measure, m memorize, and of what order. And uh, so, so what, what are your thoughts on memorization? How do you pick which scriptures are worth memorizing, which scriptures are not worth memorizing? Um, that's that's it. With scripture memorization, what's what's worth memorizing, what's not, and how do you just uh, how do you how do you put in order what you memorize, what you don't? That's it. Well, Chris is going to have a more holy answer. If you've noticed me, like, you know, I get lots of things half right, and then I, I don't remember where they are, so I have to go look them up. So I memorize enough to be dangerous. Not that I've tried just from what I hear or the stuff I really memorize. It's because, you know, I've, it's like John 3.16 or Romans 9. Or See, I'm messing up right now. Romans 9, 10, 9 and 10? Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, you know, like, I <laughs> there's certain passages, like, I've, I've memorized um, just because it's, it's repetitive. Um, or like, you know, the certain arguments we hear over and over, like Isaiah 42, like Isaiah 40, like pretty much any, anything in Isaiah 40, anything, um, you know, <laughs> um, it's, I'm familiar with it. So I don't have it memorized, but I'm familiar just because it happens a lot. So as far as what to specifically pick to memorize, I'm, I'm not your guy for that. We have the internet. I like the internet. So, you know, as long as I like remember a phrase or, or the idea, uh, you know, I'll just like ask the Oracle of the internet. And um, let it tell me. I, I'll, you know, take advantage of technology. So, uh, Chris, now for a godly answer. I mean, scripture memorization is, you know, key. Like, your word I have hidden your heart that I might not sin against you. How does a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your words. Yeah. Oh. So, so do you, Chris, do you, like, have, like, a, a weekly scripture that you try to memorize in or monthly, or do you have something like that? Do you have, like, a systematic way of doing it? Like, I, I know that there's some uh, there's some groups that actually do it, like, as a, you know, as a practice of, well, we're memorizing this scripture this week and scripture next week. Do you do anything like that, Chris? Just I suck at it. Um, so right now I'm doing Bible in a Year um, with Justin Peters on the LSB. And, uh, you know, my, my scripture memory is not as good as it can. Yeah. The reason, I mean, I, I in... an, another reason I asked is this, is, uh, Nate is, uh, or, or Chris is my wife memorizes really, really well, but it's because she basically is praying the scriptures. Like, uh, she memorized, uh, Colossians three. And, uh, so we're going to like Bible study and you have a Bible study person and then suddenly my wife can rattle the whole, the whole chapter. And it's kind of funny to watch because, you know, I, 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 I do find it's interesting because I think it's one of the more humbling things to do because it's really, really hard for me to memorize really hard. Like I have to repeat it. Uh, but she told me this system. She said, well, what you do is you read it, um, 10 times in your mind 
10 times out loud, and then you repeat it 10 times without looking. So first you look at it and read it in your head 10 times, and then you repeat it out loud 10 times, and then you repeat, see, and then you keep testing yourself by doing that. I was wondering if you guys had scripture memorization techniques or anything. I mean, when I was in Bible college, we, um, yeah, we had to remember like, oh, I forget how many, it was like hundreds of, uh, hundreds, um, of scriptures. And, you know, we did it. We basically just, uh, it was a consensus. We just remember, like, memorize the epistles and, uh, you know, like uh, Ephesians, Galatians, like all of that. And it was just is easier instead of picking out specific verses. We're like, oh, we'll just memorize entire books and let's pick the easiest books and the shortest books. So uh, that's what we did, um, except I don't remember hardly any of it now. I'll remember, like, the general principles and be like, oh, what is this? Or what, what verse is this? Or what book is this in? And then I'll let the Internet do its work. So that's what we did. We just picked... Um, you know, not for any spiritual reason. It was because we had to memorize like hundreds of scriptures and we're like, well, let's just get this done. So uh, yeah, we, we picked a lot of the books in the New Testament and just memorized large swaths of it. Here's, uh, here's another reason I was asking that question is when I first uh, became a Christ follower, I'd go into all these um, internet spots where there'd be these debates and there'd be occasionally I'd run into like a, a pastor who became an atheist, a pastor who became an atheist. And the, and the weird theology that they would all have this, this was the one common theme of a pastor who became an atheist. The number one theme was, is um, uh, they, they said there was no value in memorizing scripture. And the other thing that they had in common, we asked questions were, is they ran into financial problems with their with their churches. Like uh, they, they, they stopped making as much money as they felt they should. And so it's kind of a weird thing. So, so it was either financial um, uh, challenges that they faced or two, they, they really, really were dedicated to the non-memorization of Scripture. And that was the common thread between a pastor that became an atheist. I found it fascinating. I really did want, and I always appreciate when Chris talks about, um, you know, like miracles and things like that, and, because I, I do believe in them. But here's, here's because I've been in the environments where those things are sometimes encouraged. And what I would say is, is when it comes to those type of things that I really am convinced of 100%, is there's a lot, a lot, a lot of fake stuff that goes on, a lot of power suggestion, parlor tricks, a lot of power suggestion things where, you know, you repeat something enough times and it's just like, okay, that can make the real stuff look really, really bad. So I do believe real happens, but I do believe it's called, they're called miracles for a reason. And, and But there's so much fake that it may, oh, tons of fake, because I'd, I'd lead Bible studies and there'd be people that would try to be doing moves in the spirit and they would do stuff that was just yeah, very parlor trick. That's a good way of putting it. So I appreciate that he brings that up because it's it's important because we don't want the fake the 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 the, the real to be conflated with the fake because they do happen, but they're rare, really, 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 really rare. I'm well, I'm real quick. You know, here, here may be another question, real quick. Uh, oh, I saw you can't talk, Steph, but uh, yeah, well, real fast, Chris. Uh, are you familiar? Of course you are. Um, Jack Van Impe. Like I don't know anything about his theology, but I used to like my grandparents used to have one at their house. I mean, the guy has, like, memorized the entire Bible. So with that in mind, um, I mean, that guy is like, hey, shout out a verse, and he'll tell you exactly what it says and, you know, cite chapter and verse. So um, that being said, Chris, was his, like, theology, like, not, like, from your reform, you know, only my way theology, but, like, was he, like, remotely in, like, Orthodox Christianity or, like, traditional, or was he, like, very flawed? I don't know anything about that. Jack Van Impey was all right. Uh, the problem for Jack Van Impey is that he would just platform any, like, crazy person who would come on because he was trying to make a TV show every day. So he himself was not terrible, but the guests he had were horrendous. Oh, okay. Uh, he, he actually, he was a Baptist. He was a, he was a Baptist. He was an American Baptist. <laughs> uh, Steph, you were saying? Oh, okay. Thanks. Um. I've, I've been in the shower listening to this whole thing and I, okay, anyway, st like the, the Theo thing and everything. Okay, so Stephen, it's not like memorizing Colossians, but there is kind of this cool thing that I've been using. It's called Dwell and there's an app, there's an audio Bible app, there's studies and stuff like that. But um, one of the things that Dwell does as an organization is they memorize scripture together and they have this system for doing it um, where you, look like they have the first letter of each word in the in the thing you're trying to memorize. So what you're looking at is just a bunch of capital letters. So they have a system where, like your wife said, you read and then you read out loud and you read in your head. And then 
what you're left with through the week, you can actually order this little subscription service that will send you a keychain and a print. And it's like these really beautiful graphic, like these beautiful illustrated images, but then it has the scripture that you're memorizing. And then you can join groups where everyone is memorizing all together. So there are things like that out there that you can kind of do that make it more of like a group activity and make it more tactile, I guess. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I like it. It's helping me memorize. Steven, also, one thing that helps me personally is uh, focus on the books that you really enjoy from the Bible and just read them over and over, like Proverbs, Psalms, the easiest ones, Chronicles, or Gospels. And if you focus on those and you pray, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, will bring them back to memory. So I, I think the most important thing is to read the whole Bible and to be prepared to give a defense uh, to anyone who's asking for one about uh, Jesus and uh, the kingdom. So uh, just enjoy it. Find, find joy in, in reading it, and that'll help you memorize. Can I ask Stephen a question? Yeah. Um, you said something interesting. That's why the only reason why I came up. Like I, I understand you guys are talking about memorizing something to, um, I guess support your belief. Or I, I'm not too sure what the line of thread is. Um, however, you said pastors became atheists because of financial issues and not wanting to memorize scripture. No, no. That I knew people no, were make gonna it laugh after that. Let me repeat myself. The common theology they had, and we'd get into conversations, is they would say, look, it's not important to memorize scripture. That was that was the one common thread of theology that I found. Like when I'd say, okay, what were your, what were your 20 favorite verses? I mean, anything. I mean, I, we'd have conversations, be like, oh, no, memorizing scripture is not important. So that was a very common theme in the conversation. The other common theme was um, was they started doing not doing well financially. So that was another common theme in the conversations. And was that a theology? No. It was just a trend that I saw. However, that has nothing to do with believing or not believing in God, though. I, I, so I, I did. I, I don't. I don't say. I, I just said it was an observation. I didn't say, "Hey, look, I did an empirical double-blind study." I, that's not what I asked you. What is it? What's, to your, do, though? what's your What's your question? My question is: How are they saying they're an atheist when they didn't say anything about not believing in a God? All they brought up was seeing no relevance into memorizing scripture. And they're having financial issues. No, no, I, I, I meet former, I, I go into atheist. Um, like these were mostly on um, Facebook groups. And there'd be people that would say, look, I used to be a pastor. And then I go, okay, so t tell me about your, your favorite scriptures. Tell me about your church experience. And uh, so I'd meet them, I, you know, they'd be in an atheist room. They'd say, they, they'd, they'd say they're an atheist. They'd go through their reasoning. But the thing that would be very common is the non-memorization of scripture seemed very, very common. And the other thing that I noted was the, um, uh, because I just asked him to do this. I said, look, post more questions. I just think I have more questions about Jesus than you do. So like I have 358 questions on Jesus on Quora. I said, I just have more questions. I just been willing to question my faith more than you are. And so I did put that challenge. I said, look, put out your questions. I only have 350 and mine are there. Just at least answer mine and you can answer them publicly. Nobody's ever done it. Uh, because that's like a, a miracle that, would, that they would ever actually put written answers to it, to the questions I put out. So that's more of a miracle than asking them that, what scriptures they memorize, asking them to actually put answers in writing to the questions I posed on there. That would have taken a minor miracle. Or if they said, hey, look, I only had 350 questions about Jesus. Maybe you question more than I did. I just think I had more. I was just willing to question Jesus more than you. And I'm willing to put mine in writing. And you just expect me to have blind faith. You had more than me. So if you look up Steve Michelski, Quora, I had 300 questions about Jesus. And most of them were just like, hey, I'm not going to put mine in writing. I don't want it to be analyzed. You just have to have blind faith in my questions. I said, no, I'm willing to question Jesus more than you are. And I'm willing to put mine in writing. You just want me to have blind faith in yours. I don't, I'm not a blind faith person. If you're willing to put your questions out there, wonderful. I'm only putting my 300 out there. You may have 600, but none of them do it. So they just expect me to bow to their blind faith. I got to say, that was a lot of information, Stephen. Thank you for sharing that. However, that has nothing to do with being an atheist. Thank you. No, no I just willing to question more. Maybe you're not. What do you mean question? My point I is... I put my I'm questions in writing. I have, I have an issue with these 
pastors becoming an atheist with what you said. If a person no longer believes or says a God does not exist, that constitutes being an atheist. Well, Saying that, are you going to interrupt me? You know what? I'll just mute. Go ahead. My bad, James. This is the first time I've tried to speak since you've been talking. Um, don't know if you thought it was me or not, but I just wanted to clarify that he didn't say that was a reason for their atheism. He was pointing out that this is a commonality he just happened to notice. So, for example, red shoes wouldn't speak to the belief in a god. But if all the former pastors, now atheists, had red shoes, he was saying, I just happened to notice this is a common thread. They all had red shoes. So I don't know if that helps, James, but that's the context it was framed in. All I was trying to say. Gotcha. Well, if, if that's the only comment, like, isn't it more important to say they no longer believe in a God? That would be more important than the common thread of them not wanting to memorize Scripture and having financial woes. That's that's where I'm pointing out. Thank you. And the, 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 the thing that I, that I said that I did is I, I was just willing to put my questions in writing, and they just weren't. I, I get it. They wanted me to have more blind faith. I mean, uh, I, I put my questions in writing and publicly, and they said, look, we're not going to put our questions out there in writing where you can look at them. That's nice. You put your questions out there, but we just want you to just listen to us bloviate and talk. We're not going to put ours in writing. That's great. You do that. But you just have to have blind faith. We have better questions than you. I said, look, I'll put my questions in writing. They said, no, we don't care. We want you to have blind faith, and we want to ignore your questions that you put in writing. We're never going to answer them. We just have to have, you just need to have blind faith, and our questions are better than yours. All right, whatever. I don't understand the blind question part, hold on, but, but James, to, to go back to you, I think maybe the most charitable view of what Stephen is saying is that, like, he's describing two, two symptoms that are actually pointing back to the same diagnosis, which is an issue of theological understanding. So, for example, if you are just not, you don't see the importance of reading and memorizing and coming, becoming, like, intimately familiar with scripture then you're probably not going to make it as a pastor. And if you believe that it's your God-given right to be financially prosperous, then you're probably not going to make it as a pastor. But I, I think that's like, I think, again, most charitably, they both point to major theological problems. And it would make sense to me that people who have theological problems like that would not be, would not be successful in maintaining the faith. Gotcha. Hey, Saint, welcome. Have you been speaking? I don't think I've heard of you this morning. Do you want to speak, uh, Saint? Three, two, one. Ben, uh, Chris, if you want to talk to Ben again. Ben, I saw that you said that, you know, I, apparently you Googled, or probably used Bing because Google would have told you. But um, you said you didn't find where Justin Martyr, you know, mentioned any of the Gospels. And, you know, I typed for two seconds and got like five resources to how his first apology he specifically references uh matthew mark luke and john so um where don't know what search engine you're using but um i got plenty of references give me the name He's of using the, the stupid Bing? i wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna bring up that but please give me the reference or type it in the chat i didn't see what's it called sure what's what called where Justin Martyr, any of his writings, where he mentions the Apparently, any of the pieces. in his first apology, he explicitly mentions the Gospels as authoritative writings, and he goes on, uh, let's see, this would be the Memoirs of the Apostles. So Google that, his first apology of Justin Martyr and the Memoirs of the Apostles. Right, and the describes the, the Apostles. I'm familiar with that. He doesn't mention the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He just says the memoirs of the, the scholars are saying that he's referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that's just okay. And you're saying conjecture. he's not <laughs> okay. And you're saying he's not. There's no so evidence. For, there's, there's, there's no evidence for this outside of his writings, and that's very ambig ambiguous. Nobody else mentions these people. Nobody else mentions these books except for Irene. Oh, nobody. Oh, okay. Oh what my gosh. You? Oh. Oh. We've just moved. Okay. We, we're done, bro. You just moved us to like a spaceship. Like your whole thing was Justin Martyr. I specifically, and I'm going to give you references right now. Um, it's uh, ccel.org. Um, so I'm going to give you references right now in chat. And now you're like, okay, well, he's the only one. You specifically asked for what? Justin Martyr. No. I specifically addressed Justin Martyr, and now you're like, oh, I'm that's saying, not that doesn't count. I answered I'm, exactly I'm, what you wanted, but now you don't like that. No, I've read, I've read them. I've read that passage. I've read that that passage. He doesn't mention Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He just calls them the memoirs of the apostles. He doesn't. He does. Nobody knows what he's referring to. Scholars are trying. Everyone to Everyone knows these. what they're referring to. 
Okay, check that but out. There's there, a reference. There CCEL.org. There were many ccl.org thanks for playing ben okay i am in ccl.org right now but, um, the question i the question i was going to ask was about the the trinity i wanted to move on um if oh, you don't crap. want me to you really no I, I just wanted to ask what you what position you guys take that's all we believe in the trinity the biblical one tyler so, takes so, this one trinity oneness what's what's we so we are just, all we are all trinitarians yes Proud, happy Trinitarian. Unwaveringly Trinitarian, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Interesting. Asked okay. and answered. Yeah. So I, I always see a lot of rooms on Clubhouse where Christians are debating these things. So There's no such thing as a I'll, Christian I'll... who's not a Trinitarian. That's a misnomer. Anyone who claims to be a Christian and denies the Trinity is by definition not a Christian. Could, could you explain to me what your conception of the Trinity is? Because sometimes I feel like people have different conceptions of it. One God in three persons. Boom. That's it. <laughs> One God, three persons. So does he have three heads like a dragon or does he like manifest himself? A person isn't a head. What is a person? A subsistence and a rational nature. What is a woman? An individual subsistence and a rational nature. Yeah. So that's what the so is person it, is. It so, is it something that's beyond our comprehension? Because I'm thinking of like a three headed dragon or something. Because that's God uh, is like not a <laughs> Um, No. So God doesn't have parts. All right. Three headed dragon is going to have parts. The subsistences are not parts, they're subsistences. So they are modes of existing of the one essence. Right. And so you can think of a subsistence is like uh it's 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 what concrete like concretizes an essence. It's what makes it interactable, right? It's how we interact with things. So an essence can exist in thought, right? A substance can exist in thought, but until it subsists, it doesn't actually have any causal relation to reality or anything like that. So Three subsistences and one essence, right? Um, that's how we understand the Trinity. It's what we believe. Is it okay? Uh, I, I'm really confused because when I think of it, I think of like Platonism. You know, the, the Platonists had like a for, sort of the Trinity where they said that God or whatever concept they had of this intelligence emanated itself into different realms, and the only realm that we can mm -hmm. relate to is, is through the the noos or the sun. No, so, you've so got the, the father is Platonists think and... that the emanations are created. We don't think that, for one, uh, Plato stole from Ezra. For two, Plato believed that these emanations were created. We don't believe that the sun and the spirit are created. We think they're eternal and uncreated. Um, also, he doesn't think that the first, which is the uncreated one, has an intellect. He just creates an intellect and then the anima mundi, the world soul, right? So very different from Platonism, right? Very different. Okay. I mean, I, I thought that the, the father God in that system is beyond intellect and it, that the fact that intellect exists is kind of a, a separation. God is not beyond intellect. God is, has mm -hmm. intellect. That's your position. Okay. Okay. I, I don't really understand your Trinity concept, but I see what you're saying about the Platonic thing. You know, because I don't understand how something can be three in one at the same yeah, time. Yeah, so it's three in one respect, all... one in another. One with respect to existence and essence. Three with respect to subsistence, which is a different category. So three in one respect, one in another. Okay, so I know what existence means. Maybe I'm just struggling with the word subsistence. I hope you guys don't mind. I'm really trying to understand this. Subsistence. Yeah. I'm actually... Subsistence, subsistence is, is just going to be a mode of existing proper to a substance. So I'm going to give you this. It's going to be a very long, drawn-out definition. You can write it down if you want to. Or rec Well, this room is recorded, so this, that'll be fine. Uh, all right. Give me one second. So here you go. The definition is 
the form this is what the subsistence is the form or formality in virtue of which the suppositum is conceived of as existing totally in itself so it's just a way in which something exists totally in itself not in another subject okay so think of like the parts of a whole they exist in a subject which is the whole or accidents in a substance they exist in a subject which is uh right so these aren't the subsistence is what receives existence and it's not a part of anything else it is just itself right so this is the category we're talking we're working with right it sounds it sounds like modalist like you know that td jakes kind of way like god we're not talking about a subsistence there's no analogy at all between because i just gave you a definition for subsistence i didn't give you a definition for a person Uh, now this plays into my definition of person but we didn't even talk about the father the son the holy spirit being the same person we think they're different persons so okay that that was my question um still I don't know. I guess the platonic concept makes more sense to me, but. Mm, you don't even know. You didn't even know what the platonic concept was. I did. It's the, the, the monad, the, the one, and then it emanates the noose, which is the mind, which is intellect. He doesn't say that the one doesn't have intellect. He says that it's beyond intellect. It's, it's ineffable. It's this yeah, primordial. it doesn't have intellect. It creates intellect is it's an inferior. Yeah, it's yeah, a, exactly. It's an it's intellect inferior is... to the one. It's exactly. created, so it exactly. doesn't. You can't have some. If you're uncreated and what? Okay, if you're uncreated and the intellect is created, you don't have intellect. Okay? You're beyond intellect. Yeah, you don't have it. Okay. You, you can be you beyond. That, like, but, but, if but, I say but, I'm beyond. Uh, irrational an irrational substance it means my substances are irrational or if i say um i'm beyond uh i don't know choose, just choose any category it doesn't matter you're just saying that you don't have that or it's not a part of your being or something like that so for plato the one doesn't have intellect and it doesn't have a soul okay. in, a, yeah, in an extreme guess... platonic thought you can't even really predicate of the monad. There's nothing like it, it gets pretty bad. It gets beyond existence and non-existence, and so there's, it's just a non-cognitive world. I don't see how the Platonist worldview is any more uh, cognitive than ours. When it's you know, you just go into non-cognitivism. Yeah, I mean, it just makes it makes sense to me because it's like it, it gives kind of purpose to our existence. Because the monad doesn't is, give you purpose. <laughs> Plato, it, no, it, it helps. Plato, it helps me. Plato doesn't the give. Plato it concedes it doesn't give purpose, right? It doesn't give you any yeah. prescriptions. It doesn't do any of that. The same thing with yeah, Aristotle. My... They both concede. Yeah, there's no prescriptions. Uh, so well, I don't see how right, they. So... Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Parmenides as well. What they say is like basically God is this. It's basically like chaos, essentially. And then when the intellect emerges out of chaos, it's like order. And so, you know, it's like God, God is basically chaos and that we are the better half of God. That's what I've heard a lot of Neoplatonists say. That's which not I what tend Plato to believe. That's not what Plato believes. But that's really no, that's what the Neo that's what the Neoplatonic people say. They expand on Plato's work. Because Plato's work is very like you can interpret it different ways. But you know, Parmenides and and uh, Plotinus and then later the Gnostics as well. Oh, let me ask you this. Let me ask you guys. What do you think about the Gnostics? Have, do you have any opinions on that? They're antichrist. Uh, my Nate? quick opinion is, uh, Steph, or are you going to continue modding when I have to leave? No, sorry, I can't. Uh, you want to do it, Tyler? Uh, it would probably just be better to close the room. You can, you can close it. I don't have to keep the conversation going. Okay, I'm going to have to run. But yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Tyler said about the Gnostics. Well, God bless, th- I mean, think about it. Their whole. Oh, thank you. You too. 
I mean, think about it. Like the Gnostics, their whole thing was, you know, like this secret code or like this secret knowledge to get to salvation or to get to heaven or whatever. When, you know, that conflicts with like every other writing that says, you know, the gospel is free for everyone. Like whoever is thirsty without cost, without payment, you know, God will completely freely give them this eternal life. And uh, so like the Gnostic view is completely contradictory to everything uh, Jesus talked about, uh, you know, in all the other writings. That's my thought. But uh, everyone have a yeah, Vin. I think that's interesting. Uh, but Jesus did say, like, unto you is given to know the mysteries. So it's almost like these things were revealed. And, and now if you want to really learn the mystery, if you really want the Gnosis, then you have to be initiated. And then they would. Well, give John you the mysteries, argues against, like, the proto-Gnostic groups in the first century. And John, when, he, when, when, when Jesus says it's given to you to know, like, he's not talking about some mystical, like, fake knowledge outside of the apostles so if an apostle is debating the gnostics in the first century or proto gnostics in the first century then we should suspect that the gnostics probably don't have the knowledge that the apostles have uh, whatever knowledge they claim to have is contrary to what the apostles received so i'm, I'm just much more inclined to trust the apostles than the gnostics and just think about, the mystery. Well, I think about the mysteries, like when we talk about the, and I really am going to have to run, but when we talk about the mystery of the Trinity, right, no one's ever going to like fully be able to understand the mind of God and the Trinity, even though I think we do, you know, we have a good idea, but no one's ever going to like, you know, completely understand all the mysteries of God and the vast deepness of God. Uh, and we don't need to. So whatever mysteries they're talking about, like Jesus says, it, the ultimate answer to everything in this world is salvation and eternal life in Jesus Christ. So if you've got that, whatever other mystery you uncover is like a cherry on top. It's not going to have anything to do with your, you know, eternal soul. So if there's like some some super secret mystery, um, it's not going to be to the level of what's free for everyone, which is salvation by faith in Christ. So I would I would say that. But all right, uh, you guys can talk as I walk to my computer to shut it off. But I really got to run. Peace, brother. Thanks. All right, yeah. everyone, have an awesome Monday. You too. Peace. All right. Peace.